Father, I just pray that you minister to us, God. Lord, I pray that you just be in this message, God. Lord, that you anoint the word, God. That you anoint everything that we're going to say and do, Lord. I just pray that you're going to have your way in this place. I believe you're going to minister to our hearts. I believe you're going to open eyes, Lord. I believe you're going to do your work. And so, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you anoint me to give this message. That you anoint the hearts to receive it, Lord. And that you just have your way in this place. And so, Father, we ask all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 This morning, uh, we're going to continue with our life, laughter, and love. Uh, it's probably going to be the last in the series today. We're going to talk about love this morning. Our main scripture we've been talking about is 1 Corinthians 15, 45. It says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now, I've shown uh, this video before in church, but I feel like it's so appropriate to what we're talking about today. We're talking about love, the love of the Lord, uh, what, it, what it looks like, what it means. And so I'm going to play a video this morning. And uh, we're going to go forward from there. Golden, do you love me? Do I what? Do you love me? Do I love you? With our daughters getting married and there's trouble in the town, you're upset, you're worn out, go inside, go lie down. Maybe it's a digestion. Uh, no, Goldie, I'm asking you a question. Do you love me? You're a fool. I know. <laughs> but do you love me? Do I love you? Well, For 25 years I've washed your clothes, cooked your meals, cleaned your house, given you children, milked your cow. After 25 years, why talk about love right now? <coughs> Roland, the first time I met you was on our wedding day. I was scared. I was shy. I was nervous. So was I. But my father and my mother said we learned to love each other. And now I'm asking, Roland, do you love me? I'm your wife. I know. But do you love me? Do I love you? Well? For 25 years I've lived with him, fought with him, starved with him. 25 years my bed is his. If that's not love, what is? And you love me? I suppose I do. I suppose I love you too. It doesn't change a thing, but even so, after 25 years, question was asked in the Bible. Did you know that? Three times it was asked in the Bible. <coughs> Jesus asked it to who? Do you guys know who he asked it to? Peter. Peter. He asked it to Peter three times. He said, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. Next verse. I can go for my Last week it didn't work, so I was ready to start yelling at that. <laughs> Verse 16. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Verse 17. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things you <coughs> You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. It's interesting, this portion of scripture, if you understand the Greek word for love and the uses of what was taking place here, there's two different Greek words that are being used here. If you had your bulletin, you probably read them on the title of our message, and that is agape or agapeo and phileo. 
Those are the two Greek words that are being used here. Uh, agape or agape is in reference to God's love for us, demonstrated to us, which should change the way that our love is for Him and our love for others. It, it, it's something that is supernatural, and it's a sacrificial kind of love. But it's the kind of love that is represented when God is in the picture, when God is in the mix. Phileo is more kind of like just a fondness. Have you ever been fond of someone? I know that's a pretty archaic word for others, but we've all been fond of something, right? You ever said, you, if you're willing to say you love something, right? And it, it was like more of a fondness. Like, you know what? I'm just going to be real with you guys. I don't know if you know this, but I love cheeseburgers. I have a fondness for cheeseburgers. I will tell you this. It's not a supernatural love. It wasn't something that was birthed out of my relationship with the Lord. You know what it was birthed out of? My mom's kitchen. <coughs> my mom's kitchen, right? Her fault. Everything's a blend on her. She's why I love cheeseburgers and red meat. I have a fondness for these things. You know, I have a fondness for other things. I know some of you have sports teams, and you, you, you would say you love those teams. Maybe you have a, a, a celebrity that maybe you just have a, one of those celebrity crushes on. You'd say you love that person. You've got a fondness uh, for them. Maybe you've got a fondness for, for other things. There are certain things that we do and certain things that we have and we experience that we think that we understand and grasp things completely. But it's clear in this situation that when Jesus was asking Peter, do you love me? He was saying, do you love me in a sacrificial, godly, supernatural way? And Peter didn't understand it at the time. Peter was saying, of course I love you. But he was saying, of course I'm fine with you, Lord. I think you're a good person. I think you're a good teacher. You know that I feel that way about you. Jesus asked him three times, no, do you love me? Meaning, do you, are you willing to lay down everything for me? Are you willing to live the way that you're supposed to live as a result of my love? Are you willing to do those things? And it's a question that we have to ask ourselves today. And we're going to look at three points this morning in terms of love and what God's love is and what it means for us. And then we're going to talk about it in a little bit. The first thing it's important for us to understand is that God loves us unconditionally. Did you believe that? you know that? God loves us unconditionally. I want to challenge you this morning to think about it this way. Did you do anything to earn your salvation? Nope. Are you a good person? Nope. Coming to church, save you? Nope. I wish this was something we could preach because it would make life easier. Just paying your tithes, save you? Going to the missions field, does that save you? All of these things that are important, that are nice, are not something that would give us the ability to say, you know what, I have earned the right for Christ to save me. The fact of the matter is, there is nothing that we can do that would make God love us any less. He loves us unconditionally. I've experienced that to some degree, whether it's the love of my wife or the love of my mother or the love of one of my sisters or a family member. I really genuinely feel that no matter what was happened, they would love me unconditionally. And just to kind of give you the opposite of that, maybe you're thinking, what does that mean? It means that their love for me is not conditional on what I do. You hear me? Their love for me is not conditional on the things that I do. It's conditional on the fact that I love them for who they are. Or they love me for who I am. They love me because I'm their brother, I'm their, I'm their son, I'm their, son I'm, I'm their husband. They love me because of those things. And God loves us because we were created in his image. He loved us so much, in fact, that John 3.16, a very popular verse, says this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Now that word love there, if you look at it in the Greek, you know what word that is? It's not phileo. He wasn't fond of them. He loved them. It was a godly, supernatural love that was a sacrificial love that superseded everything. It transcended everything. He loved him so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He loves us unconditionally. So if we could do nothing to earn his love, when we experience it, we know that it is truly a gift, is it not? Amen. We can't say, you know what, I... I, I I appreciate the fact that the Lord opened my eyes to see his truth. I appreciate the fact that I experienced his love, but, you know, it's not everything. I'm going to challenge you this morning. If that's the way you feel, and I don't think you've really experienced his love before. 
I don't want to offend anyone, but if you can't say that the love of Christ supersedes everything in your life and it transcends everything in your life, I'm not sure that you're a Christian. And I would rather you be upset at me and go and find out whether or not you're saved than go the rest of your life thinking that everything's fine. And one day you meet the Lord and he goes, depart from me, I never knew you. But Lord, I was a good person. I went to church. I paid my tithes. I went to the missions field. I went to Sunday school. I Lord, I did all these things. I was a good person. I prophesied. I taught your name. And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because you know what eternal life is? To know God. That's what it says. Amen. And his son, Jesus. That's what eternal life is, to know God. And so it comes down whether or not you know him or not. And if you know him, meaning if you've experienced his love, if you've experienced the saving grace that he offers to everyone, then you know without a shadow of a doubt there's something different about it. His love for me was not just a fondness. His love for me was supernatural. It was so supernatural, they had to create a word in the language to express it. Because it was outside of the language. It was outside of the barriers of what was going on. It was introduced only when he was on the scene. And he loves us unconditionally. And what should happen when he loves us unconditionally, and this is important, the word agape, it not only expresses God's love for us, but it should in turn express our love towards him. And it should in turn express our love towards one another. And not just to one another in the church, but to everyone. Are you with me? Yes. And so we're going to look at this, how this plays out in our lives. The fact that God loves us unconditionally changes our love for him. It changes our love for him. You know, it's impossible for us to truly love without the Lord being in our life. The way that God wants us to love. It was obvious that Peter understood the concept of being fond of something and the con concept of, 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 of you know, thinking something was, was good. But he didn't have the, the, the understanding of what agape was until he experienced the Lord. And then when that happened, it changed everything in his life. And it changed the way he loved the Lord. This is what uh, 1 John 4.19 says. We love him because what? He first loved us. You know what those Greek words are? Agape. We love him because he first loved us. Now, it wasn't a result of anything we did. It was purely as a result of the fact that he loved us. Now, how does that change the way that we love him? I think if we're honest with ourselves this morning, I think we would all say that at times our love for the Lord or our devotion to the Lord can sometimes be conditional. That our desire to live for the Lord can sometimes be conditional. And we almost kind of hold God to a higher standard than God even holds us to. Do we not? The Lord loves us in spite of our wickedness. He loves us in spite of our brokenness. He loves us in spite of all the mistakes we've ever made. His love is unconditional. And that should change the way that we feel about Him. It should change the way we live. It should change the way that we love Him. But so many times I've heard Christians say, well, you know what? I'm just having a hard time right now because, you know, I can't believe God let this happen. I can't believe that this, this, this happened in my life. and I'm just going through a difficult time right now. And our devotion to the Lord can sometimes be conditional. But that's not what God designed it to be. He designed it to be unconditional. Meaning we don't love him for what he does for us. We love him for, listen, who he is. It has nothing to do with what God has done for us, although he's done plenty for us, hasn't he? We just read John 3, 16, where it said he, he died on the cross. And he says that no man takes it from me. Didn't he say that? He said, but I lay it down. If I lay it down, he said, I can pick it back up again. He loved us so much that he laid down his life for us. It was unconditional. So my love for him should not be conditional on what he does for me. So many Christians build churches because they think God's going to do something for them. Well, God's going to give me happiness. God's going to make me this. God's going to do this. And God's going to do all these things. And you know what? He does. And he can. But let me see where you're at. Maybe this is a litmus test for many of us this morning and where our hearts are with the Lord. If God did nothing for you the rest of your life, God did nothing for you the rest of your life. And in fact, when you die, if there was no heaven, 
You knew that as a, just because this is the way life was, there was no heaven, so the only alternative was hell. If you knew that that's where you were going, would you still live for the Lord today? Would you still live for the Lord today? You see, that, change, that challenges our hearts to see where our hearts are at. Are we living for the Lord just because of what he does for us? Are we living for him because of who he is? Now, I'm thankful that when we die, we're going to be in eternity with him in heaven. Amen? Amen. I'm thankful for that. And that's not for our reward. You know whose reward that is? The lamb that was slain for the foundation of the earth. That's his reward. Sometimes we think that, you know, we're going to, we're going to receive honor and, and blessings and all kinds of things there. But it says that people are going to throw them at his feet. They're going to lay down on his feet. They're going to worship him. Because none of that matters. But if it matters here, then we got a problem, right? If our hearts aren't right here, how are we ever going to get to that point? Well, let me give you some hope. I know many of you are thinking, well, man, Pastor, what can I do? I feel that way. I'm this horrible person. Let me give you some hope. You ready? There is nothing that you can do. <laughs> because you couldn't do anything anyway. You know, the Bible says our righteousness is what? It's filthy rags. So you know what you should pray? God, help me. Help me, Lord. Turn to your neighbor and say, God needs to help you. Y'all need some help this morning. I need some help this morning. Because I am totally incapable of fixing the brokenness that's in my life. And too often people struggle and waller in brokenness because they're still trying to fix the brokenness themselves. <coughs> well, Lord, if I just did this more, if I just did this more, if I just uh, operated differently here, if I worked harder here, then everything would be different. In fact, that's not the case. You ever tried to fix something without knowing the end result and how to fix it? And so in trying to do that, it just <laughs> caused more of a problem? Right? I was doing some electrical work and uh, I'm not a certified electrician. I honestly don't even know the basics of electricity. If it wasn't for, you know, YouTube or things like that, I wouldn't know what the black wire, the red wire, the blue wire, what any of it meant, right? If you know anything about electricity, it's a bad thing. Not to know those things, right? So there's a ceiling fan in our office that I wanted to put up, and I thought, you know what? I'm, everyone's busy. I want to be a blessing to those that might have to come out and help me. I'm going to try to hook that thing up, right? And it had all kinds of different wires inside of it. And I thought, well, you just connect this one to this one and put it together and everything should be good, right? So I, I turned the, light, the, the fan on, the sparks, smoke starts coming out. And I realized, oh, no, there's a problem, right? So um, I remember having to call Brother Clayton to come out and rescue me. He ended up having to go in like the entire attic and find where there was a loose wire somewhere, and he had to fix a bunch of stuff that I messed up. Like a whole half of the house was wasn't working after that debacle. And I realized that I had made it worse if I had just realized. You know what? I don't know what I'm doing. I better just call somebody that has a little more understanding about this than me. Well, when it comes to our relationship with the Lord, when it comes to life and operating in life, the Lord just doesn't know a little bit more than us. He knows a lot more than. You know why? Because he's the author of life. So he knows everything about life. And so instead of me trying to figure life out on my own, instead of you trying to operate and trying to go, you know what, I'm going to figure this thing out myself. We should just stop and realize we don't know what we're doing. Turn to your neighbor and say, you don't know what you're doing. Oh, I'm trying to get you guys in a fight this morning. Somebody going to fight. So far you've told your neighbor they needed help and they don't know what they're doing. But when it comes to life and us living life on our own and trying to honor the Lord, we don't know what we're doing. You know why? Because the Bible says that we are desperately wicked and deceitful of all else. It says that in our hearts dwell no good thing. So let me move on. It changes the way that we love Him. And so it's not conditional anymore. It should be unconditional. Our love for the Lord should be as a result of who He is, not for what He does. And we're thankful for what He does, but that's not why we live for Him. Thirdly, it changes our love for others. 
Sometimes there are folks that are difficult to love, amen? Sometimes it's difficult for us to operate that way because they are frustrating and they frustrate us or they do certain things to, to annoy us. And so the love of the Lord not only changes our hearts, it changes the way we live for Him and it changes the way we love others. It changes everything about our life. Now, think about that person and think about what it would mean for you to love them unconditionally. What would it mean for you to love them unconditionally? Many times our love for others is conditional, and it's just as conditional as sometimes our love for the Lord has been. Well, I don't love this person anymore because of what they did. I'm not going to show them love anymore because of the things that they've done in their life. Think about the person in your life that you have the hardest time loving. You might even say, just being honest inside yourself, and say, I hate that person. We can maybe think of the most heinous criminal. Think of the most heinous individual that has committed the most uh, despicable and deplorable things. And we might say to ourselves, I have a hard time loving that person. Well, you know that because of the love that the Lord has shown you, you're responsible. You have the responsibility to demonstrate that same love towards him and that same love towards others. Now it's getting quiet in church. It's easy to love God unconditionally, right? Or it's easier to think about loving God unconditionally because he's God. But you mean I really have to love the person unconditionally that's insulted my family? You mean I have to love the person unconditionally that's hurt me emotionally, physically? I have to love that person in the way that God loved me? I have to love them? Now you're talking crazy. You know, sometimes we even, we even kind of mask it. We go, you know what, I love them. But I don't want anything to do with them. You ever been there? Right? That's like saying, and hey, we're good. But don't you ever let me see you on this side of the tracks again. Because if I do, then there's a big problem. Now that's not the kind of love that the Lord demonstrated to us, is it? In fact, what did Jesus say? When he was on the cross, as a result of our sin, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Does that seem foreign to us? It is foreign. You know why? Because we are flawed people. And we all need the Lord to help us, to open our eyes, to see things the way that they are. This is what the Bible says. This is, this is tough words here. It says, if someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a what? A liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God, whom he has not seen? How can we say that we love God, whom we've never seen, when we hate those that we do see? That when we have dislike towards others because of the things they've done. And I want you to know that we live in a world right now that is filled with hate. People dislike someone, they hate someone, they don't want to be around someone because of all different things. Where they grew up, right? The color of their skin, the kind of language they speak. Even sometimes the, the way that they worship. We distance ourselves from people for all different kinds of reasons. But that's not what we see Jesus doing. In fact, we see Jesus going to the most desolate places. Jesus dealing with the most despicable people. The ones that are most damaged and have the most baggage. The ones that are in most trouble. That's the one that we see the Lord going after. And so, if you truly experience the love of the Lord this morning, you understand that it changes everything. It changes the way you view him, and it should change the way you view others. So I'm going to challenge you this morning as, as Chris comes. Think about your life this morning. Think about the way that you live. Think about the way that you have operated for so long. You might be saying to yourself, you know what, Pastor? I'm a pretty loving person. I'm nice to people. You know, I, I, throw, a little, I throw a little coin into the, to the bucket whenever those folks with the red bucket or at Walmart. I'm, I'm nice to people. I love people. But I think many of us know deep down in our hearts that there are some areas that we need God to help us. There are some areas of forgiveness, some areas of love where we need to experience the love of the Lord. And here's what I'm going to pray for you today. Because I think some of you have already hardened your hearts towards what I'm saying. And you just shut it off. As soon as I wanted you to forgive someone, 
And when if you love someone that's hurt you, you have shut me down. And you have said, Pastor, you're a good man, but I'm not going that far. I will not. It's like your heart has gotten to the place where it is completely done. Matt, is the, is the piano on? Yes. Turn the piano on for me. Thank you, sir. The last thing that God wants this morning is for you to walk out of here with the same brokenness, with the same hatred, with the same uh, division in your heart that you had when you brought in here, when you came in here. He wants you to walk out of here with a new experience of his love. He wants you to walk out of here with a new understanding of how much he loves you and how much he demonstrated his love for you. It says that he loved us in this way and demonstrated his love towards us in this way. That while we were still sinners, he died for us. We were still sinners. We still deserved hell. We were wretched, miserable, and he died for us. And it's not as if we got ourselves right, we cleaned ourselves up, we straightened our life out, and then at that point he says, you know what, these people are so good. They've done so many good things in life, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay my life down for them because they deserve it. He didn't do it because we deserved it, he did it because he loved us. And if you love the Lord this morning, you're not nice to people because they deserve it. You love them because God loves you. And so you're not being mean when you show kindness to someone. And they say, man, I can't believe you did that for me. And we can honestly say, I didn't do it for you. I didn't do it for you. I did it for the Lord. Because the Lord loved me, I'm going to love you. You don't deserve it. You've done the most despicable things in life. But God loved me. And because he loved me, I'm going to love you. Does that challenge you this morning? It should challenge you. If it doesn't challenge you, then one or two things. Either I didn't hear from God, or you're not listening to him right now. It should challenge us. And so I'm going to pray with you. In the Bible, the word of God, Baio, is also kind of a love feast. Many, many translations talk about a love feast. There are not many places in the Bible where it references this, this, such a love feast. Many people think it's the Lord's Supper. It can be indicative of some, sometimes this love feast, although these are just crackers and, and grape juice. It by no means spills the, any your appetite. But it's just an example of what the Lord can do in our life and what He's done in our life and how He is all we need in life. We need the Lord. Lord, to lead us, to guide us, to direct us, Lord, of our steps. Send His Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. And so as we think about this word of God being sacrificial, the very first that time we see this love being demonstrated is when Jesus died on the cross. Everything was indicative of that because God the Father, agape of the world so much that He sent His only begotten Son to die. And we don't agape because we love them first. We do it because he first loved us. So we're being reminded today, hopefully, of the love of the Lord. All of you are being reminded today of what God has done in your life. And if you truly have not neglected and forgotten so great a salvation this morning, then you're really realizing how much he loved you. See, I am never more aware of the love of the Lord than in times when I mess up. Times when I, when, I, when I miss the mark. Times when I fall short of what I'm supposed to do. At those moments, I'm never more aware of the love of God. Because the Bible says, whom he, that is sin, that's where grace comes in all the more, right? And those who have sinned much is forgiven much. Those who have sinned less is forgiven less. So this morning, each one of you, if you have the Lord in your life, and you say, you know what, the Lord is my Lord and Savior, He's to my life, I'm a Christian this morning, that you've experienced the love of the Lord. You understand the unconditional love of God in your life. Let that change you this morning. Let God's transformation work, His sanctifying work, take root in your life to where you start to live for Him differently. You're not living for Him in a conditional way. You don't love others in a conditional way. But you love unconditionally because of what the Lord has done in your life. So Father, I pray right now that as we get ready for taking communion, that you would minister to our hearts. 
we would understand the great sacrifice that you gave to us, that you experienced for us, Lord, that you endured for us so that we could be free. We experience this great love. May we never take it for granted. May we not abuse it. May we not ignore it. May we not cast it aside. Because, Lord, if we don't demonstrate that love in practical ways towards others and ultimately towards you, God, then we've never experienced it. You're not calling for us to be fond of you, Lord. You're not calling for us to just be kind to you. You're calling for us to love you and be willing to lay down everything for you. And, Lord, if we truly understood the sacrifice and the gift that you gave us, it wouldn't be a difficult thing to do at all. We would say, here am I, Lord. Everything I have, everything I am is yours. My house, my car, my family, my job, everything, Lord, is yours. I just want to live for you. I just want to honor you. I just want to serve you, Lord. Lord, I know this person isn't perfect. I know this person isn't living right. But God, I pray that you would give me an opportunity to love on them. Lord, I know this person is messed up. This person's made mistakes. But God, I pray that you give me the opportunity to love them. Because you love me. Father, I pray that we would have that mentality. We'd be challenged this morning with your love. That it would start with understanding what you did for us. And that it would manifest into 